The regional security system, with support from the European Union, will be conducting a panel discussion at the Government Information Service, Euronora House, under the theme, Managing Migration in the Caribbean. The discussion will focus on regional migration patterns, border management practices, and human rights practices. Come put the pertinent questions to the regional and international panelists, March 5th, at 5 p.m. at the Government Information Service, Euronora House, Point Seraphin, Castries. Rank and file members of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force, members of the Task Force for the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons, other representatives of the Government of St. Lucia, representatives of the Royal Security System headquartered in Barbados, representatives of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, our distinguished panelists, and of course, all our guests who are here with us in studio or joining us virtually. Good evening, or as you say here in St. Lucia, bonsoir. I would also like to take this opportunity to bring greetings on behalf of the Minister of Home Affairs, Justice and National Security, Senator the Honorable Herman Guild Francis, who sends his regards and best wishes for a successful event. Welcome to the second in a series of panel discussions organized by the Regional Security System. These symposia are intended to strengthen regional border security mechanisms, as well as build awareness on issues which impact citizen security in the Eastern Caribbean. The first discussion, which was held in Grenada, had examined counter threat initiatives. Today's discussion will emphasize the thematic of migration. This event is being facilitated through funds provided to the RSS under the 10th European Development Fund. We therefore thank the European Union for its support to the region. We also extend our appreciation to the government of the beautiful island of St. Lucia for hosting this event. My name is Natalie Dietrich Jones, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as moderator for these proceedings. Being in St. Lucia has special significance for me as I am employed to a research institute at the University of the West Indies, which is named after one of your noble lords. At the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, I'm research fellow and chair of the Migration and Development Cluster which is an interdisciplinary group of scholars undertaking research on contemporary migration and diaspora issues. I would personally like to convey my thanks to the RSS for conceptualizing this event and for their tireless efforts to organize in conjunction with counterparts in the government of St. Lucia tonight's discussion. Before I introduce our panel, I would just like to make a few brief comments on unfolding global and regional events which are currently shaping border regimes far and near and which would set the context for tonight's discussion. While non-binding, the recently finalized Global Compact for Safe and Orderly Migration provides a framework for member states of the United Nations to support the effective management of migration. It seeks to balance the at times opposed principles of state sovereignty and migrant rights. The compact was negotiated during a critical moment marked by a turn to restrictive or nationalist migration rhetoric and practices in developed countries, which led some to opt out of the negotiation and finali finalization process for the compact. The Caribbean was largely supportive of the compact given country status as sites of origin, transit, and destination. Among its 23 objectives, there are several elements impacting small island developing states in particular, such as the need to address climate change and natural disasters, ensure safe and dignified return of migrants, and enhance availability of pathways for regular migration. The compact is still in its infancy, and we continue to watch its evolution as states adopt its various components in their respective jurisdic jurisdictions. The second concerns the instances of political instability currently impacting the region. 
in the communique of the just concluded 30th intersessional meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of CARICOM, heads of states noted the cases of Venezuela and Haiti. In both contexts, political crises have encouraged forced migration with grave implications for neighboring states. We are also aware of the caravan of migrants which have been making their way through Central America to the United States. The cases of Haiti and Venezuela are important as they highlight the glaring absence of a regional strategy for the management of migration, as well as weak legislative and policy mechanisms among CARICO member states, which make the task of protecting vulnerable migrants, including refugees, and the displaced a daunting one. While these events pose challenges for the region, they also present an opportunity for CARICOM states to craft a pan-Caribbean response and to do so within the context of international conven conventions which many have endorsed. This evening, we will take a look at some of these issues as we explore the local perspective in St. Lucia, regular and irregular migration in the Caribbean, legislative and policy frameworks for migration management in the region, and the Venezuelan migration crisis and the Southern Caribbean. Our panelists come with a range of experiences at the national, regional, and international level. I look forward to our engagement with them this evening, as well as stakeholders working in policy, governance, and practice of border management who might be present tonight. After the presentations, we will open the floor for the question and answer session. Individuals may post questions on the GIS Facebook page or in person here in studio. Now to our panelists. Mr. Milton Dacey was enlisted in the Royal St. Lucia Police Force on the 16th of January, 1985. He now serves as the Deputy Commissioner of Police with responsibility for administration and corporate affairs and he is presently the officer in charge of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force in the absence of the Commissioner of Police. He holds several professional certifications, including a master's degree in business administration. He has successfully completed a number of police-related courses and in 2016 represented the Royal St. Lucia Police Force at an Interpol project to combat human trafficking and migrant smuggling in the Caribbean. In 2017, he also attended a seminar in Lima, Peru on enhancing strategic trade and border controls in Latin America and the Caribbean. Mr. Daisy, please welcome. Yes, good evening. And um, this evening, I'll be looking at St. Lucia's perspective on managing border security in mass migration and the challenges that we face and so on. St. Lucia, like any other Caribbean island, is faced with challenges in managing its border security. Its strategic location between Martinique to its north and St. Vincent to the south creates the opportunity for illegal movement of people and contraband via sea. This calls for constant monitoring of the borders using local assets and also by means of joint and coordinated patrols with other regional agencies. In so far as it relates to migration, we have recorded cases of involuntary migration for which some pose challenges to deal with. However, we have used these challenges as opportunities to develop policies and strategies moving forward. For those of us who may not be from St. Lucia, I'll just give you a short, I know this the time is um, short, but I'll just give us a short <coughs> description of where we are and where, how we could locate St. Lucia. The St. Lucia is a small, relatively small island with an area of about 20, 238 square miles. The population in 2013, 182,300. Um, 
Castries is the capital. We have our official language, which is English, and we also have an official one, which is Patwa, which is um, persons sometimes like to speak because um, it creates more fun, especially with um, the, the Creole. For the security sector in St. Lucia, we have um, no official armed force, unlike other Caribbean islands who may have a defense force or an army to, um, to assist us with our in enforcing the laws. Um, however, our, the Royal St. Lucia Police Force is a paramilitary force with a strength of about a 1,200 officers. And in this 1,200 officers, you have um, the immigration officers a part of the force. St. Lucia has been affected by the international drug, drugs and firearms trade and other transnational crimes. This has led to increase in gang violence and other crimes. There has been increases in the homicide rate as, and firearms as seen as the weapon of choice in most instances. And um, if we look at the record of um, over the past 12 years, we we'll look at um, the number of homicides um, that we'll, we experience each, each year. And you could see that they were about r ranking around the 30s and so on. Um, but what is significant to note is that in 2017, there was a, a spike in, in that number. However, in 2018, we were able to bring that number down. And um, persons were wondering how was it able to be done. But it was through our intelligence, um, intelligence officers. And also, there was an injection of some extra resources into the force, which allowed us to be out there and then be at the hotspots targeting these um, criminals. Just this sector reform initiative. A number of legislation and capacity building measures have been introduced. You had the first firearm and dangerous weapon laws were introduced, and this included a mandatory 10 year prison sentence for possession of illegal firearm. You had anti gang legislation was enacted in 2012. You have the Proceeds of Crime Act, which we are doing very well with because. Um, most of our resources are coming from the proceeds of, of those um, crimes. We have the witness protection bill. This, uh, um, although it is pending, it is pending implementation. You have um, CARICOM impacts, although um, they are representative there that I spoke, but we had they adopted the declaration of small arms and light weapons where this has done well for us. Now, if you look at um, involuntary returned migrants, a total of 708 involuntary migrants returned to St. Lucia for criminal and non-criminal offenses over a four-year period as follows. In 2015, there were 117. In 2016, 301. There was a significant increase. In 2017, 165 and 2018, we recorded 120, 25. And if we are to look at it via the um, various countries where they, they came from, we have Matnik at the top with um, 449. And this, I would say, it explains why in the beginning when I said that because of the close proximity of St. Lucia and Matnik, persons are able to migrate illegally to Matnik and when they are um, caught, they are returned to St. Lucia. So we had a record for 49. In Canada, 122. France, we had five. In the UK, 23. 47 from the US, 
two from Venezuela and um, 60 from within the Caribbean it itself. In 2015, St. Lucia recorded its biggest case of human trafficking, where a total of about 75 students were trafficked into St. Lucia in the belief that they would be attending university. Large sums of money were paid for entry into the said university. However, um, s those who have followed the, the, this case would realize that um, there were very, we experienced a lot of challenges in um, dealing with those um, students, especially um, keeping them in a secure, secure area or during the processes of um, the court. Also, um, in terms of repatriation, taking them back, that is um, re-migrating to their um, original locations. And that is costly, and I believe that was one of the challenges that um, we faced during the time. There are existing laws and institutions that are relevant to the processing of involuntary return migrants. At the international and regional level, St. Lucia is signatory to several treaties relating to migrants and the free movement of people, and um, some of which are the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, International Labor Organization Conventions on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Family, Convention on the Rights of the Child, the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, the Free Movement Protocol under the CARICOM Single Market and Econ Economy CSME, Free Movement Protocol of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean states. And we have the Millennium Declaration, which emphasizes humanitarian law, international human rights, and sustainable development. And we have, of course, our laws, St. Lucian laws, um, where the Constitution Order of St. Lucia, which is uh, our supreme law, and most laws are designed or framed out of this. We have citizenship. Act of 1975, we have the Aliens Act of 2008, Immigration Act, and all these um, acts, these are laws that are available to us where, where reference can be made and um, to identify whether persons, especially if pers um, re in reintegrating persons into the system. Now, um, police actions. We believe that um, upon receiving <coughs> report and process involuntary retained migrants upon arrival, you collect data and manage information of the um, involuntary, involuntary um, migrants. You maintain a criminal database on high risk, Ver verify if any of the involuntary migrants have St. Lucian criminal antecedents um, because even coming in, you would need to know whether those persons, whether those persons uh, have committed offenses where they um, are being returned from. We would also need to monitor the risk associated with um, the criminal and high risk um, involuntary returned um, migrants. You communicate with regional and international stakeholders with reference to the involuntary returned um, migrants. Also, the um, Ministry of External Affairs, um, that's a medium where we need to use so that um, we'll be able to engage with the various external agencies, uh, missions overseas, to coordinate the response to request for the verification of the St. Lucians uh, within readmissions. Verify the identity of St. Lucian nationals in an 
efficient and timely manner. Recommendations, reintegration and rehabilitation services and social support. Rehabilitation and integration services for involuntary return migrants should include the one um, accommodation because um, most times if those um, persons are returned to our, to our shores, they more than likely they may not have a place to shelter. And um, sometimes they have left families that probably they have broken ties with. So um, I believe at the first instance, we need to identify accommodation for those persons. Then um, we're looking at the job placement or employment, education and skills training, health and medical services, including mental health and substance abuse chill, um, treatments. General services, including case management and referral contract services for readmitted persons, children, and their local families. You finance, advice, and counseling, and mentoring to reduce and prevent re-offending behavior. Because um, sometimes, and we do experience it, although we, do not ha we have not had mass re um, migrating um, persons. However, um, those that come, we have seen a trend where they bring in some habits with them, especially, um, I could give an example, car theft, for example, where they, they come down and they're very skillful at that and then they may introduce it to our locals. So if we keep ties on them, if we, if we could have them integrated back into society, I believe this um, could assist a great deal. That is um, the end of my presentation. Yeah. Something that we actually found out this when we talked this morning, the connection with Martinique and the high number of involuntary return migrants that come from that country. Um, he also highlighted the challenges that St. Lucia faces as a small island developing state with monitoring quite porous borders. Um, and uh, I think something else that um, Ms. Nassif will speak to, which is the high number of international agreements that have been signed, but the difficulty with um, implementing those agreements. So I think uh, Ms. Nassif will address that in her presentation. We'll move now to Ms. Joyce Lynn Hughes. And I'll just introduce her while they sort out the computer. Ms. Hughes is Border Security Liaison Officer for CARICOM's Implementation Agency for Crime and Security, that's known as CARICOM Impacts for short, <coughs> which is based in Trinidad and Tobago. She previously served as Senior Immigration Officer in Antigua and Barbuda, having joined the department in 2001. She has held several positions, including Deputy Chief Immigration Officer. Uh, she's participated in a number of sessions, including, this is training, a three-week United States Department of State's International International Visitor Leadership Program, which focused on combating trafficking in persons. We welcome Ms. Hughes to the podium and look forward to her presentation. Good evening and thank you. And first I should say on behalf of the Executive Director, thank you to RSS for inviting us to this forum. I promise I won't be long. <laughs> okay, we can start by looking at the map of the island to see some of our challenges. And of course we can see that um, the map, the map depicts countries who are not even a part of CARICOM. Mm -hmm. And thereby this is why we have so many challenges, especially migration, migratory challenges. Since it was the third border for um, North America to include Canada and also transitory route to European states, 
and of course be we're between the largest producing states for illegal drugs and of course the largest consumer. This slide now depicts some of our common threats in the region, but for this evening what we'll do, we'll concentrate on human trafficking and the irregular migration. Okay, just a little, I'm gonna take about a minute or two to speak about CARICOM impacts, knowing that um, it is not quite known. Um, in, in 2005, the heads approved this CARICOM, the CARICOM framework for the management of crime and security. And um, in 2012, it was amended to include CDEMA, which deals with, with um, disaster management, and CAFA, that deals with health. Now, um, CARICOM has like quasi-cabinet arrangement where prime ministers or presidents uh, has lead responsibility for a particular issue. And of course, security, Trinidad and Tobago, has the lead responsibility for this area. Uh, the structure, as you see, do have um, standing committees as a, of heads of law enforcement and secur security agencies. And they provide technical advice to policy and political heads. Now, um, they're actually the backbone for policy, to, for driving policies in the region. And these include the standing committees of commissioners of police, chiefs of immigration, military heads, controllers of customs, um, heads of intel and financial, heads of intel and financial agencies. And in 2016, the heads added the heads of corrections. Now meetings are held twice annually um, with these committees and the next meeting of Chief of Immigration and Comptrollers of Customs will be held in Grenada next month, that's April. And about impacts, impact structure, we have the headquarters which deals with policy and strategy formulation and oversight of its two sub-agencies. We also coordinate meetings, which I spoke to earlier, and also implement HEADS decision. And we do offer capacity building also to border security officers, police, intel, and intel. Joint Regional Communication Center, which is in Barbados, that deals with passenger targeting through the Advanced Passenger Information System. It also deals with the cargo profile, will be dealing with cargo profiling, implementation of the ACES, which is the Advanced Cargo Information System, will, will start implementation in April again. I think it's April 23rd, 2019, that's next month. And also, we do share information sharing with border security officers on persons of interest, um, travel history reports, and also frequent flyer travelers report. For the Regional Intelligence Fusion Center, that is the intelligence arm of the agency, and they deal with monitoring the occurrences of potential and actual threats as to, so that they could give the region early warnings and also identify issues, con issues countries of interest, and persons of interest, and they do monitor threat trends. Now this is the crime and security strategy. Um, the, um, the crime and security strategy, this was approved in 2013. The assessment was done in 2010 and then it was approved in 2013. The risks are prioritized in four tiers. Now, if you see human trafficking and human trafficking, migrant smuggling, natural disasters, those were in, those were seen as tier two, which are substantial threats, which is both likely and relatively high impact threats. Now in 2018, we, we, well in 2017, the heads mandated that we review the strategy and uh, some changes occur, which, um, which were migrant smuggling and human trafficking remained at tier two. However, um, Natural disasters went to tier one, and the future risk, which is climate change and migratory pressures, are now tier two, 
tier two threats, which are substantial threats. So they move from tier four to tier two. Now um, we added we added deportation as a new threat, and that's in tier four. And also border conflicts was also added as a new threat, but that's on the tier three. Now how this is done is that um, questionnaires are sent to member states and they will identify their threats and then we do an, an analysis and come up with this. Now the, this was done in 2018, I'm sorry, and it is yet to go to a to consulate and then to heads for approval so then we can amend the current crime and security strategy. Okay, migration patterns in the region. Okay, so then these are some of the trends that define migratory flows in the region. And of course we could look at the free movement. People move because of the free movement in OECS and also for CSME. Environmental induced migration, hurricane, emigration of skilled professionals. And this is with CSME and also persons are moving from the region to other countries internationally. Feminization of migration, that's more women are moving. Increase in return migration and the commissioner spoke about his return, 708. And this is something that we're dealing with also. And of course, the region is a transit point for irregular migration flows to developed countries. OK, these are some factors motivate, that motivate people to move, of course, for economic means, violence. And sometimes we figure that persons are just moving for economic means, but there are other things that are tied to the movement, which are, of course, violence, a stagnant labor market, so persons will move, that can be seen as economic too, political instability, natural disasters, to re reunite with family members and also for educational purposes. Irregular migration. So we can say that there are several types of um, irregular migration movements in the region um, that we've identified. And um, the three major ones are irregular migration from non-CARICOM member states who transit the region hoping to go to the developed countries. We also have intra-regional irregular migration where persons would go to other countries in the region and of course overstated can become irregular after a while. And we do have irregular migration from of our CARICOM nationals to also developed countries. Now trafficking in persons, we know that this is a modern day um, it's a form of slavery, and it is, doesn't affect our region alone. It is actually affecting all countries. And of course, we can be seen as a, di as a um, transit, a transit um, country when it comes to m like, um, human trafficking. Now, um, advertisements are placed to track persons to come to the region and as cashiers and, uh, you know, domestic workers, manual workers, and so forth. And then after they get here, then it is an issue. So um, the ACP EU Migration Action Plan was launched in 2015, and it provides technical support to governments on human trafficking and also migrant smuggling. Now, some countries benefited from this technical assistance to include Grenada, St. Kitts Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and, of and Trinidad and Tobago. So um, I think there, there, nothing, there is a meeting also next week on migration, on human trafficking and migrant smuggling. And of course, the involuntary return migrants, which we are having some issues with, and I slipped over migrant smuggling. We do have migrant smuggling in the region. But the thing is that um, the data is not available, and that is, a, that is a problem that we do have in the region when it comes to um, identification, identifying these, these um, challenges. 
mass migratory pressure, of course, um, I did say earlier that it was a level four in 2013 and from the 2018 threat analysis, it is now a level two. And uh, CARICOM member states, we are faced with difficulties when responding to large flows of migrant, lack of preventative measures or emergency management plans should include responding to these needs. Um, in um, Antigua, Barbuda, Dominica, Barbados, and Jamaica, they, their emergency management plans do have specific tasks for immigration department in them, but of course we still need to look at more. Okay, so these are some of the trends, of course, I spoke about that earlier, the volume of persons moving, diversity of their pro profile, the dynamic nature of how they're moving, their routes. Um, most persons are coming by planes also, and some are coming legally, but, depart legally, but departing regularly. And we do have an issue with mass return of deportees. And this is a very big challenge. I mean, it's not really in our region, but it's also globally the public opinion on migration that is really highly divided and it does affect our policies. We do have a problem with our borders, monitoring our poorest borders. And of course, I spoke about um, deportees return and also there is a problem with, with repatriation of some of deportees of some nationalities. Of course, substantial cost to countries receiving these large scale, and Trinidad will speak to that later on. And we do the lack of systems, asylum and formal systems, and my colleague here will speak to that. And of course, the increase in migration on women in prostitution in the region because of the mass migration. We do have lack of operational procedures, especially nationally and regionally. We do have gaps in our national legal um, frameworks. Corruption plays a part also. And we do have investigations that don't lead to convictions. And sometimes it takes years, actually, for um, persons to go to court. And of course, lack of data. Some policy procedures, what we're doing with um, ACP, not ACP, EU, under the European U Union Development 10th Development Fund. We are looking at a human trafficking regional assessment, um, regional assessment to study, actually to provide a not better understanding of the human trafficking in the region and by gathering relevant information. And also, we're looking also at developing a repository for human trafficking, and that should be coming this year through CARI Forum. We're looking at a regional approach to deal with common regional approach and a common policy to deal with um, return and reintegration of deportees. And also we're looking at a regional response plan. And all these will be discussed at the um, Chief of Immigration meeting and Comptrollers of Customs meeting next month. Um, the way forward, we think that having a regional approach is really good, like a common legislative um, and policy-related matters in the field of mixed migratory flows. Um, we look at diverse capacity building initiatives and what we did, I mean, we, we've done training with border security officers to include immigration, customs, police, coast guard, and even airports, airport and seaport personnel. Um, personal. Um, also, we, it is good to have sharing of expertise in key technical areas, such as those countries, Bahamas, who has procedures, and Trinidad, to work with the, lesser, the other countries. And also <coughs> collaborating on risk management, contingency planning, and emergency management to build early warning systems. Um, so these are really go ahead, <laughs> regional approach. And we could promote, by doing it regionally, we promote best pra practices in information sharing and data management, enhance our data collection systems and sharing relevant data, and also to develop coordination arrangements among all agencies, 
and build a regional migration response plan. <coughs> by my trafficker. I was promised a better life, but got forced into domestic servitude. I can be any age. I can be any gender. Any ethnicity. I am, I am, I am a victim of trafficking in persons. Know the signs, see it, report it. If you see me, please help me. Call the TIP hotline at 847. Okay, we're back from our break and we thank you for rejoining us in studio as we discuss the management of migration in the Caribbean. So I'm going to introduce Ms. Lila Jane Nassif, who is the head of mission at the United Nations High Commission on Refugees in Trinidad. Ms. Nassif received her Juris Doctor from Loyola University in 1992 and subsequently read a Master's in Law in International Trade at the University of Amsterdam in 1995. She is a member of the Bar in the states of New York and Connecticut and has clerked with the Office of Immigration Judge in New York before joining UNHCR. She has held multiple postings in the Middle East as well as in the Horn of Africa and brings with her that experience to her position in Trinidad. Welcome, Ms. Nassif. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Before I begin, I'd like to take this opportunity, one, to uh, thank the RSS for this panel discussion and also the European Union for supporting and making this panel discussion possible. So I am going to speak tonight in a general way on the legislative and policy framework for migration management in the Caribbean. And I will start with a quick overview, defining terms and talking, a then I'll move a little to the legal and policy frameworks, touch on good practices. And as Natalie mentioned before, I'll speak a little on the Global Compact on Refugees as well as the Global Compact on Migration. I'll try to make a few suggestions. And then because uh, in the region, we are all facing a lot uh, and confronting what is happening in Venezuela, I will speak a little about that as well. So very quickly, when we are talking about migration for UNHCR, you really are talking about persons in several distinct categories. You have asylum seekers, you have refugees, you also have migrants. Uh, asylum seekers are persons seeking to be recognized as refugees. They are persons who have expressed a fear of persecution and their study of their claim is still in process. And it is on that basis that they maintain they cannot return to their country. Refugees, if you go by the traditional UNHCR definition, there are five reasons why a person would be recognized as a refugee relating to persecution on the basis of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. And then clearly that person cannot go back home because they fear being persecuted, uh, or they face serious risks to their lives uh, if they go back to their country. Migrants are persons who leave their country for other reasons. Uh, it could be employment, it could be study, it could be simply tourism, and they can return to their country. They do not face any risk. Um, what you see now is basically, um, when we talk about refugees, when we talk about migrants and others, from a UNHCR perspective, we are always concerned about the issue of protection. 
And as a refugee agency for the UN, we are guided by the 51 Convention and 67 Protocol that define or recognize who is a refugee. And now on the screen you will have a quick listing or a quick view of countries in the Caribbean, those that do belong, uh, those that have become signatories um, to the Convention on Refugee Status, those that are not and those who may have also other uh, legislation or procedure that would impact on refugees, asylum seekers, and others. Uh, this is now a listing of the various countries concerned. You would see that in the Caribbean, most countries are uh, signatories to the convention and the protocol. Um, uh, in the case of uh, Anguilla, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, they are not signatories to the convention or protocol. Cayman Islands, Montserrat are, as are the Turks and Caicos. With the Netherlands, um, the situation is also a little different when you're thinking about the ABCs. Aruba is uh, onto the protocol. Curaçao is not, neither St. Martin, but also those countries fall also uh, quite a bit under, uh, for foreign policy, look to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands to set the tone. Uh, there are, as I mentioned before, other uh, legal and policy frameworks uh, that potentially guide uh, how you deal with migration. Uh, Natalie, of course, was mentioning, and Mr. Desi were mentioning about the Universal Declaration for Human Rights and others. There are the constitutions in Trinidad and Tobago. There are also good examples to be seen from their uh, 2014 refugee policy that is under consideration. They've also used quite a few. Um, they have innovation innovative techniques, for example, uh, that they have instituted to alternatives for detention. Here I'm thinking about the orders of supervision. Uh, looking at other uh, practices in the region, Guyana, which has started to issue uh, renewable stay permits as Venezuelans have started to come in. Suriname has done the same uh, with issuing uh, two-year uh, permits for refugees and asylum seekers. And then on a regional, le on a regional level, uh, countries in this region have started talking um, going back to the Brazil Plan of Action, and that has then subsequently led to the Caribbean Migration Consultation. So there is an ongoing dialogue as uh, both Joyce and Mr. Desi and Nas Natalie and also I know Charmaine uh, will be reflecting on that, um, that is ongoing on migration and how to deal with it uh, regionally. Looking a little in depth at the Brazil Plan of Action, uh, Declaration and Plan of Action, it encompasses 29 countries, three territories in Latin America and the Caribbean, and it was passed in 2014, marking the declaration, marking the anniversary of the declaration of the Cartagena Declaration on Refugees. Uh, Cartagena Declaration on Refugees is quite important. It has um, it is the guiding principles, I would say, in the region for Latin and Central America. And also, its definition has also uh, had an impact on countries in the Caribbean. Um, the Brazil Declaration seeks to improve the protection and achieve solutions for displaced persons and refugees and stateless persons. It is also through Chapter 5, it uh, elaborates enhancing a regional cooperation, uh, looks to establish asylum systems and refugee status determination procedures, and promotes comprehensive, durable solutions with a focus on local integration. Uh, last time countries met in February 2018 to look at their pledges, and that was a time when the Global Compact for Refugees was under discussion. As mentioned previously, um, 
There is now ongoing a Caribbean migration consultation that came about in 2016 with the support of both UNHCR, my agency, and IOM, which is the International Organization on Migration. And this is leading to a regional policy focused on coordination and a rights-based approach on issues related to migration and displacement. And UNHCR has uh, come in to, uh, with technical guidance for the development of refugee legislation in the Caribbean in this regard. Um, the Global Compact, there are two. It came about following the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migration that was unanimously adopted by the um, UN General Assembly in 2016. Uh, the Global Compacts came about in 2018. There are two. The first is a Global Compact on Refugees, which aims to provide a more um, equitable and I would say uh, responsibility sharing arrangement among countries. So there is a sharing of the burden. UNHCR has then helped to come through with a comprehensive refugee response framework and it seeks to put pressure on countries that are facing uh, influx situations. The Global Compact on Migration, it aims to mitigate the um, the factors that hinder people from uh, building and maintaining uh, sustainable livelihoods in their countries of origin, but also intends to reduce the risks and vulnerabilities migrants face at different stages of migration uh, by respecting their human rights and also providing them with assistance and as Natalie mentioned, aims to balance individual rights of migrants also versus uh, state concerns. Uh, this is uh, just quickly a table reflecting um, the voting rights of the countries in the Eastern Caribbean region. As you can see, most of them have supported the Global Compact on Migration and the Global Compact on Refugees. Okay, with regards to suggestions from our agency, we have come up with a variety of ideas, probably most recently in March last year. We have put out guidance notes on the outflow for Venezuelans. We support creating legal pathways to reduce irregular migration. We think it is very important to recognize that migrants, refugees, asylum seekers can really contribute to the countries that they are in and that um, we want to continue to assist in developing cooperation to address involuntary migration, promoting the social and cultural and legal integration of refugees and asylum seekers and migrants in the communities they are in. Uh, looking a little at Venezuela in particular, uh, to date more than three million persons, Venezuelans, are thought to have left their country. Uh, most of them have gone towards Latin and uh, towards South and Central America. Uh, approximately 5,000 persons are thought to be leaving daily from Venezuela. Uh, there is also within that movement a number of returnees such as Colombians and also Guyanese that are leaving Venezuela and going back to their countries. Uh, with regards to, um, to our projections, uh, for ourselves and IOM uh, at the direction of the um, Secretary General. UNHCR and IOM are leading the response among agencies for Venezuela and we have set up a response plan for Venezuela in 2019. We are looking or projecting up to 5.3 million persons who might need aid with potentially aid reaching uh, up to 2.2 million. 
Uh, in terms of objectives, we have immediate objectives, emergency objectives, so that refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers are provided with uh, emergency assistance, life-saving assistance, and that we work to assure that their rights uh, are respected, that they find protection. But from a long-term perspective, we are hoping for that they will be able to socially, economically, culturally integrate into communities that have been empowered and capable of receiving them. And in that regard, we also look to support the host communities where the persons are moving into. Uh, in the Caribbean, five countries right now are experiencing the majority influx of uh, Venezuelans. Uh, largest numbers are in Trinidad and Tobago, but we also have them in Aruba, Curaçao, Dominican Republic, and uh, Guyana. In terms of the regional response uh, under the umbrella of uh, UNHCR and IOM, there are, um, I believe, um, uh, more than 14 agencies, UN agencies involved, countless NGOs, uh, all working together, 422 activities, uh, nine objectives, and approximately $35 million that is needed to assist in responding. Uh, the main areas for UNHCR in terms of our response, we look to prevent forcible return to countries. That is known as refoulement. We look to support countries in putting putting in place legislation and procedures to help with responding. We look at temporary shelter and humanitarian assistance for basic needs. We are looking at protection concerns for women and girls and boys. And then we look to support communities in main hosting areas. Thank you. Right on time. I'm, I'm, liking, I'm liking these presentations. Um, we have one more. Um, Ms. Nassif's presentation actually segues nicely into Ms. Andrew's presentation. She will speak on the Venezuela, Venezuelan context specifically. I will introduce Ms. Gandhi Andrews and then hand over to her for her presentation. Ms. Andrews Gandhi Andrews is the Chief Immigration Officer at the Immigration Division of the Ministry of National Security in Trinidad and Tobago. She is the first female to hold this office. She joined the Trinidad and Tobago Public Service, you can clap, <laughs> <laughs> in 1984 and became an Immigration Officer in 1989, rising through the ranks to now lead the division. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Information Systems and Management, a Bachelor of Laws, and a Master of Science in Public Sector Management. She has been extensively trained in migration management throughout her almost 30-year immigration career. I don't believe that. <laughs> and she has seen firsthand changing migration trends. I now hand over to Ms. Andrews um, to share her presentation on the Venezuelan migration crisis. Uh, thank you very much. And I have to mention that today is Carnival Tuesday in Trinidad and Tobago. So RSS, your timing was probably a little off, <laughs> but it's timely in that even though it's Carnival and we have thousands of persons coming in for the revelry, at the same time, you have a lot of persons with mal intent coming in at the same time, using the guise of carnival to come in. So that we, what happens a lot of times after carnival is that a lot of people overstay their time. So that kind of, of um, and I wish you would put the, the presentation up just to pay homage to my countrymen and, and the carnival celebrations <laughs> in Trinidad and Tobago in my opening slide. Um, the thing is, and one of the things in, in border management and something that countries um, keep close to their hearts is this issue of sovereignty. 
And there's a quote by Joshua Press, the attorney at law at the US Justice Department, that says, from our perspective, all states have an inherent authority to police our sovereignty. Every country in the world has migration laws to govern who comes in, who can stay, who can be detained, how they will be detained, how they will be deported, whether they are offenses and what the penalties for those offenses would be. But when natural disasters take place, when there's an economic collapse in a country and civil unrest, when there are wars and terrorism, how relevant are these wars, are these laws, when this is what people go through? When there's despair, when there's desolation, when there's no hope, when there's hunger and there's nothing for them, do they think about laws? People do not think about laws when they are faced with situations like that. They just want to move. And over the last few years, the migrant crisis in Europe um, coming out of the Syrian wars and the acts of terrorism, the natural disasters that we've had in Dominica and even Antigua, those have pushed people out, displaced persons, and they just want to have a better life. So they will, if you don't let them in, they will come anyway, and they will find any way to come into Trinidad and Tobago and to any other country, whether it be a land borders and they cross over, just crossing a line in the sand, or whether, like our small island states with porous borders, that they find a way by boat to get to our shores. And we can't police our shores. It's impossible to put Coast Guard and police around the island. We simply will have to put everybody living in our country around the island and say, you border, you manage the borders. So there's a little clip recently in Trinidad and Tobago. I wanted to play it for you, but there were too many profanities in it where um, persons were able to capture migrants coming off a boat illegally at a port in South Trinidad, which means that people will come regardless of if there's a law or not. And over the years, Trinidad and Tobago has had a very close relationship with Venezuela. And I'm going to stick to Venezuela and the context of Venezuela and what we are seeing happening. And for us, we are the closest island to Venezuela. It takes perhaps on a speedboat 20 minutes from the closest point. Because at some point, it is just seven nautical miles mm -hmm. to get from Venezuela into Trinidad on the southern coast. So it is that close. It is even closer than their island of Margarita. Now, what we've seen over the years is a movement of Venezuelans coming in and out, movement of drugs, guns, and people come and, and other goods coming out of Venezuela. And it has happened over the years. We've had a number of headlines over the last year and a half, maybe, um, where we see Venezuelan crisis spills over into, in the, into a small island, Venezuelans arrested, um, Venezuelans held for possession of guns and ammunition, um, Venezuelans arrested for illegal entry, machine guns coming into the country, women being arrested at Rich Gold. Rich Gold is a known brothel in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, refugees. Trinidad and Tobago, a, population destin a popular destination for Venezuelan refugees. Um, and more and more, we perhaps face a human humanitarian crisis as more Venezuelans come for refuge. Uh, we are even seeing a resurgence of piracy between Trinidad and Venezuela. And a number of our fishermen have been affected by that. The question is, is there really a crisis? Is Trinidad and Tobago really experiencing a crisis with Venezuelans moving into Trinidad? Um, UNHCR, I got this uh, in February 2019, showed a number of countries where Venezuelan nationals are moving to. And with estimated amounts of Venezuelan nationals, 
um, living in those countries. And for Trinidad and Tobago, there's a figure of 40,000 Venezuela nationals. There's a little dispute about that. Um, because I have some figures from my border management system, which tracks all the arrivals and departures of persons, which shows between 2014 to now a significant decline in the numbers of Venezuela nationals arriving legally into Trinidad and Tobago. And note, I said legally into Trinidad and Tobago. So it went from, let's say, a high of almost six, of over 61,000 in 2015 to last year, 2018, just about 28,000 persons coming in to Trinidad and Tobago at a legal port of entry. Now, we are seeing a number of overstayers, and over the years we are seeing that those persons who came in legally are overstaying their time in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, last year we've had just about 4,000, the year before 2,000, so there's an increase over the years. And I've included here um, numbers of Venezuelans who have gone and registered as asylum seekers and refugees with UNHCR. And these are the figures that we have. Venezuelans did not start registering as asylum seekers until 2016, at least in Trinidad and Tobago. But between 2016 and 2019, there are almost close to 10,000 registered asylum seekers and refugees, Venezuelans, in Trinidad and Tobago. So statistics always have to wonder about where it's at. Here we're looking at, from the enforcement unit, how many Venezuelan nationals has Trinidad and Tobago detained? And we are again seeing an increasing number of Venezuelans being detained for breaching the immigration laws of Trinidad and Tobago. In 2016, it was 212. Last year, it was 1,375. And concurrent with that, or coming out of that, we are seeing that more and more of those persons that we detained have entered the country illegally. We went from 29 in 2016 to almost 600 in 2018. And so far for this year, of the 338 Venezuelans we have detained for the year, 200 of them entered the country illegally. So we are seeing a trend where they are declining in arrivals legally, but the illegal entry is now increasing. And what I need to say with that is that many of the Venezuelans we see coming in have no documentation. They have no passports. Some of them have no cedulas. And what we have found is that some of the persons who claim to be Venezuelans are not Venezuelan nationals. They are coming from other Spanish-speaking countries and using the situation in Venezuela to enter Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm going to discuss the, the impact of what we are seeing with the Venezuelan crisis in, in the context of six key border management issues, and that is security, legal issues, economic, societal, regulatory, and managerial. I may not get to the last two, and I want to focus on at least the first two. Um, in terms of security, because we are seeing the numbers increasing for illegal entry, we know that there are human smuggling rings existing. And a lot of it is organized crime because what we are seeing is that the humans, the persons, I mean not put it as humans, the persons are being smuggled into Trinidad and Tobago on the same vessels that are carrying drugs, guns, and ammunition. Right? So we are seeing that trend, and it is worrying because it is organized networks, and they're coming from Venezuela, they're linking with the locals, the Trinidadians, to move persons across. We see an increase in prostitution, and that in itself is worrying because that leads to other issues within the jurisdiction. You're talking about one of the key things is a breakdown in moral values because it is spreading throughout the country. Trafficking in persons when there's prostitution, sexual exploitation is the highest incidence of, of trafficking in persons, especially in our region. And therefore, once there's prostitution, you can very well expect trafficking in persons. And the other criminal activities happening, 
um, corruption being another one where you find that a lot of persons are getting involved and facilitating illicit activities. Um, on a societal level, what we're seeing is a resurgence of diseases. We are seeing an increase in persons coming in from Venezuela with malaria mm -hmm. and measles and other diseases. Um, we are seeing, strangely enough, an increase in divorce because of infidelity. We are seeing young people coming in from Venezuela, and those are serious issues. Those, the Venezuelan nationals coming in, and there are a lot of young people, and they have no education. There's no school. Because of the laws that we have in place, or lack thereof, they cannot attend school. We are seeing some xenophobia creeping in to the country because of the amount of refugees and asylum seekers and Venezuelans, because not all of them are claiming asylum. And one benefit is that we are seeing Trinidadians becoming bilingual because they want to communicate um, with the Latinas. On an economic level, what we are seeing, and it is, is an issue, is a legal importation of goods, animals, and plants. And for the animals, you would expect we've seen horses and cattle and uh, goats and other animals being brought on vessels into Trinidad. And the risk for us is the diseases that may come with the animals and spread to the local agriculture. Same thing with the plants. We see a flight of foreign exchange. We see with the increased workforce available, we are seeing now a downward trend in wages because companies and employers are able to now hire Venezuelans at a lower wage than if they had to hire a Trinidadian. And that is an issue. And of course, there's bartering. I bring two guns, you give me some food to take back home. And that is what we are seeing a lot of. We have outdated legislation. And that's a fact. Because our legislation did not contemplate a lot of these issues. And we really need to change legislation and develop policy to address a number of these challenges that are facing us. Um, with the numbers coming in and with us prosecuting for illegal entry, because that's what my law says I have to do, a number of persons are filing for judicial review. Even those persons applying for asylum. So we have a number of cases going before the court um, for judicial review. And if there's no legislation, perhaps the judiciary can then or will have to then make a decision and set precedent in that matter. Um, when we talk about regulatory issues, we're talking about visa policies and whatnot, what other measures we could put in place um, to restrict the movement of persons coming into the country. And on a managerial level, we're talking about resources, capacity building, and networking. So what do we do? Government recently decided that they will look at a policy to deal with Venezuelans and to register Venezuelans to work. The idea is to allow Venezuelans, whether they came in legally or illegally, to register with immigration, and that will clarify the numbers in the country. And then we could look at what skills they have and how we can issue a work permit or work permit exemption so that they can work legally. Because really and truly, most of them want to earn money to send back home to their families. And that's really what they would like to do. For our region, collaboration really is key. We need to share information. We need to share intelligence. And we need to share expertise. Because that is the only way for our region, as a CARICOM region, that we can address this issue. Because we realize that once it starts in one country, it starts moving up the islands or moving down the islands accordingly. And therefore, it is indeed a time for us to collaborate more on some of these issues because we need to move from talk to action because action changes things. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Um, so that concludes the presentations for this evening. I have some questions for the panelists. I don't want to abuse my position as chair, but I will take questions. Okay, we're moving to another break, so we'll take the questions after the break.
human trafficking happens in plain sight. Know the signs, see it, report it. To report suspected cases of human trafficking, call the TIP hotline at 847. Okay, and welcome back. We are at the phase of the question and answer session, and we will open the floor for questions either from persons in studio or who might post questions online on the GIS Facebook page. As I said earlier, I have some questions for the panelists, but I don't want to abuse my position as moderator. So I'll open the floor if anyone has any burning questions, and then I will ask the, the panelists the questions that I had prepared. Question for Ms. Nazif, UNHCR, what level of support is UNHCR granting? I'm not going to train that because, um, as Charmaine said, if it happens in one, it's only a matter of time before it comes down. And it's twofold. Um, sometime last year, the government of St. Lucia imposed visa restrictions on Venezuela coming in. We may get one or two coming in legally, but the visa regime is in place and that stands. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding that, the possibility exists for illegal migration and persons coming in. Our borders, as we all know, are very porous and it is, it is impossible to police it all. Mm -hmm. It comes at a cost. UNHCR has a part to play in it all. What level of support is UNHCR willing to give, has given, or intend to? Because if the movement of persons about 5,000 daily comes down, it's only a matter of time before they see the gaps where they can come to the islands. And if we learn from what Charmin is saying, we need to be ready now. Question again, what is UNHCR willing to do, has done, or intends to do in the not too distant future to help prepare us or buttress what is going to happen when all hell breaks loose? Okay, before Ms. Nassif answers, could you identify yourself, sir? Inspector Lucius Lake, Head of Immigration, St. Lucia. Okay, thank you for your question. Okay. Well, thank you for your question. I would say that the foremost support that UNHCR can give any country is in helping to give guidance or to give ideas in putting in place procedures, legislation, to allow countries to be able to respond to a situation of influx or a situation of having uh, refugees and asylum seekers and or migrants come in. And this is what we would seek to do in any country. We also are ready to support communities. We would want to advocate for countries to be able to take a rights-based approach, so one that would be able to examine uh, persons, their actual need in terms of are they having a real protection problem so that they are not put at future risk. And I believe strongly that the approach that a country can take uh, and is not simply just to look at it from a security perspective, but to look at refugees and asylum seekers, as Charmaine was also suggesting, as potentially assets that can contribute quite a bit to your country, whether socially or economically or culturally. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions from the floor? All right, so I will begin um, probably moving around the table. So I'll start with Deputy Commissioner Desi. Um, what do you think is the most challenging issue for the management of St. Lucia's sea and airports? Okay, um, I believe that in terms of the airport, um, one of the challenge that we have faced is with our border management system um, because as um, you would appreciate that we have to liaise with the other agencies, the other um, islands, so that we could get the information, especially with um, APIS. And if you do not have a proper system, that um, you cannot do it. And that is why um, the government is moving towards having a, a brand new border management system, so which we believe would address that. In terms of um, by sea, as 
it has, I believe, my question have been answered in terms of the, the porous borders uh, that we cannot control. Um, we have seen, and it's recorded, that most persons who come by air, you, they come in legally because they need to get a ticket, they get their passport, their documents, and so on. We have the visa. But by sea, mm -hmm. they do not require anything to come. It's just a decision to leave where they are and come across. So uh, most times you may be lucky to, for some of them to be caught. Other times they come into our um, shores. Okay, so just to clarify for those of us who don't work in immigration, when you say border management system, is it a software that you're referring to or is, is it more The system than is that? the, um, it's, I would say it encompasses everything from the software, your hardware, your personnel and everything that comes with um, your day-to-day um, -day activities mm -hmm. in managing our, our borders. Okay. Yes. All right. And so for you, the more challenging issue yes. is the seaport and not the airport. Yes, the, the seaport in terms of um, persons in as much as the airport where the system needs upgrading or mm. um, a, a new one. But with the seaport, it is very challenging okay. um, to manage. Yeah. All right. OK, so we have a question from the mm. floor. Um, please introduce yourself and then you can um, pose your question. Good evening. Um, my name is Shikari Gravelis and I'm a program officer in regional integration at the OECS Commission. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is for Mr. Daisy. Um, I note from your presentation that your statistics for involuntary return migrants and um, I think it was homicides, both in 2017 there was a spike in those statistics. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know whether there is a correlation between the involuntary return migrants and the increase in um, the spike in, in homicides? No, um, we did not detect that. And um, we could not say that there was a correlation between the, the returned migrants and um, the homicides committed, although we may have seen it in terms of some other um, crimes, but not in terms of homicide. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll move to Ms. Hughes, and I think some of this was touched on in the last portion of um, Ms. Gandhi Andrews' presentation, but what advice would you give to CARICOM heads of government to support a collaborative approach towards the management of um, undocumented or some people say irregular migration? Okay, I'm thank you, Natalie. Yes. Um, <laughs> In December 2018, that's last year, um, the heads decided that um, they will move to full free movement in um, 2021, in the next three years. Now, and even to the single domestic space, proposed single domestic space that, were, that we had in 2007. Now, there are several things that we need to do in order to get to that area. And even for now, too, is number one, we need to share information between our um, between our agencies or countries and also to use the systems that are in place which is the joint regional communication systems mm -hmm. and the regional intelligence fusion system we need to even start from there to start to share mandate member states to share information intelligence information communicate to each other now, we also need to harmonize to look at our legislation. And Charmaine did speak, to, speak about that, the antiquated laws in member states. Mm -hmm. We need to look at that because they're not aligned to the human rights laws and the international laws, the other laws, and so forth. And uh, I mean, the bird border management system, this needs to be integrated. So at least, I mean, integrated be within member states so at least we can see who's moving and so forth i mean it's a lot but we have to take baby steps to get there okay and so basically share mandate member states to mm -hmm. share information intelligence information and also to look at all laws and the border management systems okay and what resources do you think the region would require in order to make that a reality <laughs> 
It uh, will require a lot, but then the thing about it is that if we're looking at the trends to manage our migratory trends, mm -hmm. then at least we have to look to see if funds or security, which one? Because in the end, I mean, it will, security mm -hmm. will always be on top, will mm -hmm. always be on top. So I think that even though you're looking at funds, funding and so forth, it's something that you, in the long run, it is better to just mm -hmm. use the money's funds now to do these sort of things than, because in the long run, it will definitely be uh, more expensive. Okay, so the trade-off, I, I see the hand, the trade-off yes. is um, pay, um, have the financial have expenditure now, now mm -hmm. um, for security mm -hmm. in the future. Okay, the, there's a gentleman at the back, um, the mic is somewhere, at, okay, he has it. Um, can you identify yourself and then pose My your question? My name is Dale Elliott, I am the island consultant for the International Organization International Organization for Migration. Okay. My question is to Mr. Daisy. Earlier, you said St. Lucia recorded 50, 55 people, even traffic in a couple years ago? 75. 75. Mm -hmm. If you were to deal with a case like that in 2019, considering all the training, panel discussions, and so forth, how would your organization deal with it differently? Okay, um, in terms of dealing with it, uh, unlike the first instance where where we had um, the police were responsible um, for dealing with police immigration. Um, however, um, through the mistakes that were made, or through, as I said, the challenges that we had, there were um, government that put in place a, a joint, I would say a joint committee, whereby which um, involves members of the um, social, social um, services, Ministry of um, Social Development, you had its uh, permanent secretary in the Ministry of Home Affairs, the police being represented, customs being re represented. So you find that at all angles where help could have sought, you have a representation on that um, task force so that if that event reoccur, we'll be able to be better placed to deal with it. Okay. And for Ms. Andrews, just to, to use mm -hmm. your... Um, um, country as a case as opposed to um the, the thing with with trafficking in persons is that it's so difficult one to identify mm -hmm. it's difficult to prosecute and you require the cooperation of the victim in most of the in all of the cases because you require the information from the victim in order to do your investigation and then your prosecution because you have to gather your evidence. And since 2013, when we proclaimed our trafficking in persons legislation and soon after that, that was in January and April, we prosecuted our first person under that act for trafficking in persons, uh, for trafficking three, three Colombian women that matter only went to the High Court in 2017. It took four years to go through the Magistrates Court. And then there's not a date yet set in the High Court for that matter to move forward. And within that time, you're talking years, and a lot of your victims want to move on with their life. And it is difficult for them to relive their nightmare over and over and over. And we have to find ways in order to move that prosecution forward faster than what it is. And we've had a number of cases in Trinidad and Tobago. Just recently, there was a, a raid where they found 19 girls at different locations, and they're investigating now as to whether they are in fact victims of trafficking. But it's difficult and it requires commitment from the judiciary and everybody else involved to really prosecute and, and to deal with those issues. It's heartbreaking when you do what you're supposed to do and then it gets stick, or stuck in court. And we know that we're dealing with and everybody is innocent until proven guilty, but it's difficult to see victims being dragged through after what they've gone through 
um, in being trafficked to see them have to do it over and over and over. And um, we've had in the region with IOM over the years, and we're going back to 2008, um, when IOM started funding trainings and, and, and whatnot in trafficking, we still have a long way to go, even 11 years later. We have the laws, but it's in the implementation of the laws is where we find the difficulty a lot of the times. Okay. So I'm going to pick up on two things that were said about um, the challenges that small island developing states face. So one is the porosity of borders and the challenges that that poses in terms of managing migration, and the other is the um, the slowness, if you will, of the the court system in terms of prosecuting cases. What, and this is open to anybody on the panel, what um, challenges do you think hinder small island developing states from effectively managing migration? The, the porous borders is in fact the most challenging Challenge. issue. Mm -hmm. um, while we have, we have to rely on intelligence, in terms of identifying the networks and identifying where they're coming up. And for us in Trinidad and Tobago, and I'll speak to Trinidad and Tobago, we know that most of the times they come up along the southern border. And through intelligence, we've been able to identify places. Um, recently, we have been targeting those areas in Trinidad. And we have been arresting a number of persons arriving on the southern border. Um, the military, yes, the defense force, they are down there working with police, working with immigration. However, when you tighten one area, they just move somewhere else. They just move to another area, you know, where you cannot police. And you have to rely on the intelligence. And um, that's, that's the biggest problem that we have at this point in time in trying to manage the migration that we are seeing. Um, the sharing of information is the other one. For some reason, it happens within countries and it happens between countries. People don't like to share this information. Why? I have no idea. I don't know if it goes back to, goes back to the issues of sovereignty I mentioned in my presentation. But for us to do what we need to do, we have to share the information. When we get the intelligence, when we see certain trends happening in one country, ultimately it gets to another one. And we have to be able to share those trends. And while we meet annually, chiefs of immigration and controllers are customs, and we meet annually and we discuss a lot of these issues, many times it's a discussion. And nothing happens thereafter. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we need to move from that point of talk in terms of action and really active collaboration. And not just once a year, but throughout the year, whether we identify points of contact and those persons. And, and at the more of the operational level, I think we need to get the persons together at the operational level so that they're the ones who get the intelligence. They're the ones who are there seeing a lot of the trends. And we need to have a network at the operational level throughout the region to really look at some of these issues. And I think in that kind of collaboration, we might start to make some strides into identifying criminal activity, identifying criminal networks, and most importantly, having the intelligence to disrupt those networks. Mm -hmm. All right, so. And I will add something. No, I go ahead. Also add to mm -hmm. what Shaman is saying, too, is that, I mean, most of the regular migrants also, they arrive legally and also depart um, irregular by regular means. Now, the thing is that sharing of information is key and also it's how we treat the information when we get it also because of course GRCC is there and they would say to you, okay, look for John Brown, he's coming in. But then sometimes when they call back to say, okay, what happened? I mean, member states would say, oh, um, they went or we didn't check them or, or those sort of things. So you're still getting the information and you're not using it mm -hmm. also. So that is a real challenge there. But I, I think the key word there is timely sharing of the information. <laughs>
Because sometimes you can't get the information after the person has already left. It makes no mm -hmm. sense at that point in time. You know, so it's a timely sharing of the information. And I think as we work with JRCC and we put better systems in place, mm -hmm. so how to share the information, yeah. mm -hmm. that system will get better. Right, but there, there is a challenge though of data. Um, data. So access to data, um, sharing of data, mm -hmm. um, reporting of data. Okay. You mentioned the disjoint between UNHCR's mm -hmm. 40,000 and then what you have recorded in, in your um, um, administrative yeah. system. So how then, what's the best way to enhance the data gathering and sharing process? I know you say we need to share, but what, mm -hmm. what exactly would that look like? And, and that's the thing, um, because we identify the trends mm -hmm. in terms of managing migration, for Trinidad and Tobago, we have an integrated border management system. And we get a lot of data out of that, which we share within Trinidad amongst our intelligence agencies and others. Um, so that information is there. Sometimes it may need an MOU mm -hmm. in order to share the information. Um, Sometimes we have to go out and either we engage the international organizations to perhaps do some kind of data collection for us. So for example, IOM had offered a data tracking matrix, a data tracking system in order to see how many Venezuelan nationals are in the country. Mm -hmm. Of course, it comes down now to a government decision as to whether to accept the assistance or not and at a regional level, whether or not we would engage IOM, and I know that Joyce Lynn mentioned before, engaging IOM and, and UNHCR and others to gather some of that data for us mm -hmm. and present it, because then it comes down to an issue of resources. Mm -hmm. Collecting data sometimes could be expensive, and if people don't see, or governments or agencies don't see the value in collecting the data, because collecting it is one thing, using it is something else. Because you have to use it to create your policies, mm -hmm. to inform whatever it is you're doing. So that is the importance of it. And therefore, we can't just collect it. We have to do something with it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is policy decisions. So one, to collect it. Two, to share it. And then in sharing it, to inform the policy once again. All right, so evidence-based policy making, and I'd like to bring in Ms. Nassif um, just to ask her opinion on how an enhanced data regime could support development of legislative and policy frameworks in the Caribbean. Well, I find that I agree very much with what Charmaine is saying, that uh, data is important and can uh, be very um, critical in putting in place the right systems and policies that you need. And I absolutely agree with her when she talks about how you treat that data is key uh, in order to put in place the right policies. It's not just simply, from a UNHCR perspective, it's not just simply the, the security concerns that are being expressed, but also keeping in mind that uh, how you use this, um, this data in order to enhance the protection of people, which is ultimately what you would want. So you want to take an approach that would then be able to be respectful in the policies that you are designing. All right. Okay. We have a question from, okay. One, okay. So I'll go with Ms. Monloy first and then very briefly, is Claudia Monlui, Department of Home Affairs and National Security, Assistant Focal Point Trafficking in Persons. I noted from the presentations that clearly St. Lucia has a revolving door challenge, as well as Trinidad and Tobago. And I am wondering whether we have addressed this at the regional level with a solution in mind, or is it a case where we just have to acknowledge it as a recurring malaise, which essentially 
has no solution. So is there are some controls or are there some controls that we could at least put in place on the ground or sensitize persons, etc. What can we look at by way of addressing these situations where persons are sent down last week and back in the same territory the week after? Thank you. Are we talking about um, human trafficking or irregular migrants? Which one? Irregular migration. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, there, um, what we're doing is to see how best we could um, work with IOM to do uh, IOM and also UNHCR. We're looking at doing an MOU to assist member states in managing this um, in both the migra irregular migration to include asylum seekers, even, I mean, all asylum seekers, human trafficking, and so forth. So, yeah, we are looking at a system there because we do have even, as I identified in my presentation, we do have even CARICOM or CARICOM brothers and sisters also coming through the region and also trying to go to other developed countries. And that is an issue because, of course, we do get the hit back from the third, the, the um, developed countries. So yes, it's something that we are looking at to see how best we can harmonize our um, policies and procedures in handling that. Because what happens in St. Lucia is also happening in St. Vincent, is also happening even in Bahamas and so forth. So yes, we are looking at that. Any of the? Um, I may make a, a few comments. I do think it is important to yeah. acknowledge that there have been a lot of efforts that have been done on a regional level and that potentially also th at issue now is to now bring it back down to the local level to what is being done in a particular country and to encourage that country to put in place those steps those procedures those laws that are needed so that active yeah. uh, response is potentially what is needed at this time. Okay, so thank you. And um, Lieutenant Commander Roberts has a question. Yeah. Good evening. And this question is for Ms. Andrew, Gandhi Andrew. Um, you would have mentioned the movement of primarily Venezuelans and some, and some other nationalities from the South American continent. But are you picking up the movement of any other nationalities that may not be from this region? <coughs> Yes, we are. Um, we find that a lot of extra regional um, migrants are coming in to Trinidad and Tobago um, via Venezuela. And by that I mean persons from various countries in Africa, um, from Syria, even from China, um, from Sri Lanka. We've seen a number of wide um, very diverse kinds of persons coming in through Venezuela. And a lot of them, when we've done some of the work through Interpol, um, a lot of them do have criminal antecedents. So the challenge for us, though, is in getting the information from some of those countries, identifying some of them, because a lot of them may tell you, and we, we see it a lot with the African nationals, they tell you they're from one country, but they're really from somewhere else. So they tell you they're from Ghana, but they're really from either Nigeria or Senegal or Guinea Conakry or a whole host of other um, countries they come from. So we do see a whole lot of other nationalities coming in besides the Venezuelans and the other persons from Central America. Um, some of them are involved in a lot of criminal activity and we have a lot of them who we have prosecuted for criminal activity, drugs, guns, um, even making fraudulent documents um, because we know some countries have a certain skill set that they bring to the region. We see persons from um, the Eastern European bloc coming into the country as well and um, skimming credit card and ATM card, debit card skimming. 
So, and we've seen that even coming down from the other islands, um, not only coming in from Venezuela, but they come in legally from some of the other islands because they go island hopping as well. So we do see a lot of other nationalities coming in. And um, Inspector has another question. Uh, dealing with migrants comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, do, we have not addressed it in one way, but it is the responsibility of each country to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And look at the unemployment levels in each territory, um, the ups and downs as it comes through. It was interesting that one of the presentations spoke about the, uh, the renewal of stay, especially for the Venezuelans and the ability to allow, allow them to work. I see that as a bit of a challenge that the individual countries are not able to seek employment for all of their persons. And we have these migrants coming who are fleeing rightfully from strife in their countries. Not just the traffic, just the migrant part of mm -hmm. it. And coming in, and the individual states have a responsibility now for receiving them and all what comes with it because we're going to get guidance from UNHCR in that regard. It comes down to the dollar figure. Is, has any agency or institution been sort of spoken to in relation to giving some relief to the countries who, like Trinidad, who has the problem right now and the others in lieu of it happening? Because if what is happening comes down now, all the, most of the islands in the region will be that way. But we have to fend for our people, first of all, and then the migrants, and you don't want to further create any problems or difficulties for them. So the question is, funding in that regard, have we spoken to anybody? Is anything happening in that regard as a regional approach through CARICOM in that regard? I throw it in for the entire panel. Funding is always an issue when you're dealing with anything migration related. Even when you detain someone, the cost of detention when you repatriate someone, the cost of that repatriation. Um, recently at a joint select committee, we told the committee that the average cost of keeping one detainee is 250 TT dollars a day at the detention center. Um, we spend an average of maybe 15 million, 15 to 20 million TT dollars annually on the detention center. And that is keeping persons, the cost of the facility, persons, um, the employees, etc. We've chartered an aircraft on two occasions to take African nationals home because, by commercial aircraft, it costs almost 200,000 TT dollars to repatriate one individual. The reason being, it's not just the cost of the ticket for that individual, but you need escorts to take them home. And airlines have put in place their policy is that if a flight is longer than eight hours, eight hours plus, you must have three escorts. Because while one sleeps, two of them will be guarding the individual. So it's an expensive enterprise from the point of detention. Migrants come in and they find work. So it means that there is work. The question is, how do you regulate that? And how do you not open them to ex? exploitation, and I'm using exploitation, not in the context of trafficking in persons. But how do you prevent employers from paying them less than what is your legislated minimum wage? Because they will take less, because they'll need the money, right? So they do find work, and they can support themselves, and they want to support themselves. The funding comes in managing such an enterprise. When I spoke about, and it's something that we have to consider now when ministers talk about registering the Venezuelans, etc., there will be a cost attached to that because you may have to hire staff, you may have to rent some place because you can't have thousands of persons coming in to the office on a daily basis to register. You have to take that somewhere outside of what would be your normal office. So there are a lot of considerations. I know that UNHCR has offered to help and has continued to offer assistance, and so too has IOM. They have continued to offer assistance to government in order to deal with the, the asylum seekers and those persons who may not be asylum seekers but find themselves in a vulnerable position. 
and therefore they, they can fund. It is just, again, a collaborative effort in order to get it done, identify what the issues are, what the needs are, and then come up with a plan for okay. it. I thought we had time for one more question, but we're actually down to the very last minute. Um, unless our panelists have a burning comment to make. Um, Ms. Nassif, I saw you. Well, I, I, I'm not going to add anything other than to say <laughs> yes, that we are ready to support <laughs> Trinidad <laughs> and Tobago. Okay. And, yeah, and yeah, other yeah. countries as well. Okay. Um, so from what we've seen and heard to this evening, migration is a very complex phenomenon. And we have discussed but a fraction of the key issues impacting the region to date. Um, we anticipate that you will continue to engage with each other and in your own circles to um, continue to explore the issues that have been raised tonight. And so in order to close off this evening's proceedings, I'm going to invite Lieutenant Commander Brian Roberts Director of Training at the RSS to move the vote of thanks. But we thank you for joining us this evening and uh, um, look forward to the RSS, um, the other series of panel discussions that the RSS will hold throughout the OECS. Good night. So. Good evening all. On behalf of the Executive Director of the Regional Security System, I extend, I extend warm thanks to you and to everyone for a stimulating discussion on the most salient issues surrounding migration in the contemporary Caribbean environment. First, let me express our profound thanks to our main partner, the European Union. As you know, this panel discussion was funded through the 10th European Development Fund project. A, collabor a collaborative funding initiative between the RSS and the European Union. We appreciate the assistance in supporting our request to raise awareness on key issues or security issues, I should say, and trigger much needed discussion among our stakeholders. To our wonderful panelists of it, pan panel of experts, let me first um, express my thanks to Ms. Leah Nassif from the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Thank you for the succinct presentation on the legislation and policy frameworks necessary for effective migration management in the region. The presentation will certainly raise awareness in the current work of your organization and also areas to potentially strengthen human rights within border management systems. We are extremely delighted to have CARICOM impacts on board with us this evening. This organization manages two legacy agencies from Cricket World Cup 2007, the Regional Intelligence Fusion Center and the Joint Regional Communications um, Center. The latter contributes greatly to regional border management efforts, primarily through the Advanced Passenger, Passenger Information System, or APIS. Ms. Huge, thank you for taking the time out from your busy schedule to highlight the patterns and challenges with border management in the Caribbean. Today, we got an opportunity to focus, if only for a brief moment, on the Venezuela crisis and its impact on border management practices. I'm sure that our audiences, both here and the online, were grateful for the information shared. Mrs. Gandhi Andrews, we truly appreciate the various lenses you give to view the impacts of this phenomenon and the approach is currently being considered by one of our Caribbean territories. Thank you. To Dr. Dietrich Jones, I hope I got that right. <laughs> Thank you for skillfully steering us through the second panel discussion in the series and ensuring that we kept with the timelines. Your remarks and engagement with the panel and the audience helped to shed some light on important issues ripe for discussion. We truly appreciate your wise counsel in delineating the thematic areas, thematic areas for discussion and we look forward to uh, even building a stronger relationship between the RSS and the UWI. Mr. Milton Dizzy, Deputy Commissioner of Police, Royal St. Lucia Police Force, thank you for, for providing the local context to migration and border management by extension. We are also profoundly grateful for the tremendous support 
you and your team provided to the RSS headquarters in coordinating this event. Thank you. To the audience, both here and in the, in the studio and online, thank you for supporting this discussion. Your engagement of the panelists implies that it was a worthwhile experience and we look forward to continuing engagement in the future. And the media, you are a crucial partner in raising awareness among agencies and publics, and we are grateful that you supported the event today. A special thank you to the team here at the GIS for making this, their facility here available to us to broadcast this event live. I also take this opportunity to inform the audience that the event will be rebroadcast by GIS and will also be available on the RSS website. Last, but by no means least, a very, a very special thank you to Ms. Claudia Monlouis from the Ministry of Home Affairs, Justice and National Security for the tremendous support um, you provided to our team at the RSS. You were very dedicated and committed to the task and your, con and your contribution was instrumental to the success of this event. Once again, thanks to everyone. Have a pleasant night. God bless. The regional security system, with support from the European Union, will be conducting a panel discussion at the Government Information Service, Euronora House, under the theme, Managing Migration in the Caribbean. The discussion will focus on regional migration patterns, border management practices, and human rights practices. Come put the pertinent questions to the regional and international panelists, March 5th, at 5 p.m. at the Government Information Service, Euronora House, Point Seraphin, Castries.